Hey everyone, um, welcome to another episode of the Light Movement podcast. And this week we are gonna talk about reimagining art education. So I'm super excited for that. And I am here with Alana Anderson and with Christina Shear. And they are both professional artists and they both have gone through the mastery program and um, they also are both quite accomplished in a, another creative career. So it's gonna be a really interesting, super exciting um, podcast. And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm looking forward to what you guys are gonna say. I have no idea. <laughs> we don't either. <laughs> I know. Um, and so, um, let's see, what did we talk about last week? I'm trying to remember. Um, I'm supposed to remember this. I can't remember. You're going to have to watch last week. Just go watch last week, and then you'll know what we talked about. Um, it was good, whatever it was. I know unicorns were a part of it. We're talking about unicorn businesses. Right brain, gosh, I can't even remember. You were in right brain land. I was in right brain. Last <laughs> last week's podcast was a little um, interesting because we got like really caught up in our conversation and we wound up in like right brain land somewhere. It's the and best land to be in. I know, it's the best <laughs> land to be in. So hopefully that happens today. Um, in case you're wondering where Jake and Dimitra are, um, they had to go out of town um, for a family thing. And so uh, they will be back. Um, but this week... I, I get to do this. Mm, so lovely host. I know, I'm the host. <laughs> um, okay, and so then at the end of this, we are going to uh, critique um, some pieces from you guys that you have put on that hashtag, um, Milan Art Breakthrough 2021. No, I didn't get it right. What is it? Art Breakthrough 2021. Okay, Art Breakthrough 2021. <laughs> uh, that's the hashtag. So um, if you want your artwork critiqued, for uh, this podcast, not this podcast, but the next podcast, um, post your work on Instagram using that hashtag, and then we'll be able to find your artwork and critique it. So we're going to critique three pieces today um, with you guys. So yeah, we get to hear your mm -hmm. input, and then um, and then we're going to do question and answer. So any questions you have for any of us, we want to answer them. Okay, so Christina, let's start with you. Um, tell us just a little bit about. Your, oh, before we get to that, these two ladies are on the um, Outstanding Artist show. So we just got done uh, just filming wrapped. yeah, season two of Outstanding Artist, which you can find on um, Milan Art Club. So it's this reality show that we do where we put all these artists through these crazy uh, competitions and adventures, and they have to like run around with GoPros and find, you know, art supplies and somehow in like just a few hours pull off a, an amazing painting and it's the art olympics it's yeah, the art olympics it, i was gonna yeah. say art boot camp but that's good art boot that's camp. good <laughs> definitely boot camp it's really hard keyword crazy you said crazy yeah it's pretty intense it's, it's intense yeah. yeah but fun it is any doing anything intense uh which i think we'll talk about anyway in all art forms just helps you grow a lot really quickly. Yeah. yeah, and it was really fun to see so much growth um, with these 11 artists um, in this last month because it was like a month of a complete like art, you know, uh, what would you call it? Intensity, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, it was really fun to watch you guys grow and uh, I can't give anything away. So these guys could have gotten out like right in the beginning you know, and stunked, or, you know, they could have made it all the way to the end. We don't know, Do and we can't it? say anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Christina, tell us a little bit about your background. Like, what, what was that other career that you got really far in, and, and of course, is still one of your passions? You're kind of like a Renaissance woman. I do a lot. Yeah. So do you. <laughs> we yeah. Have people, we all do a lot. Yeah. Um, okay, which camera do I look at? Do I look at you? I just talk. Yeah, you just talk. Okay, so I, <laughs> <laughs> I grew up um, acting. I knew I wanted to be an actor when I was three years old, and that was so deep and profound in me. because I. Feel How like did you know to be an actress at point, three years old? Is that because I was three and it was so definite, I've always followed it because it was so... Wow. A three-year-old shouldn't know that, and it right. was so immediate and so... Just there was no other, there's no negotiating it. 
So what did you do? Did you do like a, a play where you in something where you're acting or you just like told jokes My to your family? My whole or? life I just told the entire world like I'm an actor. Everyone knew it like whether it was true or not like it I just things would happen and I started doing commercials when I was six. Actually, my very first job was really cool. If I think about it now as an adult, I got to do the commercial for California, um, the like Adventureland, like the- Oh, okay, uh, like an amusement park. Yeah, I mm -hmm. got to go there before anyone had ever been to that theme park, but I was six. So every time they were like, do you want to ride this ride? I was like, no, <laughs> that's scary. <laughs> it's like if I was at least nine, maybe I would have ridden one of them. But it was really fun. And so I did commercials up until I was about 15, did a lot of commercials. And then at around 15, I started doing more film and television. Okay. Yeah. So what was your favorite film and television project that you did? Um, well, I would say my favorite film and television project is probably the one that I'm most known for, which was The Intern, which was with Robert De Niro and Anne Hathaway. And it was just, it was my first movie. It was really cool. I got to go to New York and it was just a crazy experience. All, yeah. All and, you, all. and you got to meet famous yeah. actors and... You had a really cool role. I rem I totally remember you in the movie. Yeah, it's a it's a sweet movie. It's yeah, a really good yeah. movie. And you were and super funny. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, but for like also your first movie, a lot of people's first movies are maybe like a horror film, and you, or maybe it's like kind of weird, like you do an indie, and then yeah. you don't want to tell your family to like go watch it. But for yeah. this, I was like, yeah. whole family, like go on, watch it. It's great. Yeah, yeah. So that was really cool. And so you were the Anne Hathaway secretary. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, and so. Um, yeah, super cool. And um, okay, so we'll get more back to like education and, and mm -hmm. all that. Yes. So let's talk about you now. Mm -hmm. So tell us your background and your what field did you go into and you went really far. Okay, so um, from like way back in the old days, 1999. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was the year Dimitro was born. Really? Yeah. I feel old. <laughs> okay, so um, I, I, I graduated high school and um, ended up uh, taking a path into working in a print studio which fueled a passion for graphic design. Um, and so I took that path and fairly quickly um, started to build a lot of relationships through that and really enjoyed like getting to know clients and understanding how they wanted something to be created. Um, and so I'm not sure how far back into my past you want me to go. Well, you, so, you, I mean, from what I understand, you, you went into design, mm -hmm. everything from graphic design, um, and then eventually kind of went into creative director, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then you managed a lot of big creative projects, and yeah. you went really far, and then tell us about, like, your, like, your last job that... Okay, so I'll, I'll go back to, like, a little before that. So um, like when I started out, the internet was kind of just, just happening. Um, so I learned sort of on the go, like about websites. And so I, you know, I was doing everything from, um, you know, logos and print design and signage and everything that a business could need. And websites were just getting started at that time. So mm -hmm. um, UX design wasn't a huge thing back then in terms of like, there were no apps. In terms right. Of, like, it was JavaScript days. Yeah. I, I don't know. Um, but anyway, I was the I'm just saying one. terms that I know nothing about. Yeah, I don't really <laughs> know as much about the technical stuff. Um, but visually, I, was, I would create like all of the visuals. And um, so more recently, um, I worked in a tech company and learned about um, software design. So mm -hmm. creating user experiences. And um, I got to work with some really incredible brands. And um, yeah, and this was something that um, just sort of expanded my opportunity to, to just learn more and put, you know, more design skills in lots of different areas. And I managed a team of designers and um, worked on helping the business grow and yeah. Okay, so you both have been, you know, pretty successful in um, another sort of creative field. And then at some point, I think for you it was um, COVID, right? Because you had to move from LA 
moved from New York, like you couldn't be in those sort of acting hubs mm -hmm. where everything was going on, right? And you moved to Kentucky mm -hmm. and um, where family was and, and during COVID and sort of, what, what, do you, what would you say, just kind of like, I mean, got I, an opportunity to pursue other things or? I have, I, I started painting when I was 15 and it was always something I wanted to go back to. And uh, the opportunity arose, right? Just, I always feel like for me, for my life, I, I, I think this goes with a lot of artists too. There's a lot of courage and trust that must be. Yeah. You must be really willing to go on trust, especially in acting. And so I go where life opens. And for me, the mastery program came at a time when it just opened naturally. And I just always follow that. If it doesn't make sense, that's OK. It makes sense later. And it just opened for me. And I'm really happy I did because you're right. It was a time when everything, my whole business shut down. And it's still picking back up now but it gave me the opportunity to still create on my own terms while that was shut down. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I always make this joke um, about Christina because, you know, she... It's she's... a really good joke, guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't, don't <laughs> give them that big expectation now. They're going to be like, wow, wow. That's true. It's good to me because I, 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 I like reheard it in my brain a few months later and was like, that is super accurate. <laughs> okay, so she, she um, you know, pursued acting and then and then you know is you know pursuing art and like selling her art and and just starting her career really in art and then she also has these you know she writes and and you know has these ideas about making making some stories and some books and then she also you know sings and you probably dance too whistler. i'm sure I do she not does. dance oh she doesn't dance and she's a professional whistler so she's <laughs> she, like when i say she's a renaissance woman it is very accurate so what I love to say about Christina is that, you know, art is her fallback career in case acting doesn't work out for her. Um, Good. And well, it was specifically when I painted this one painting and you saw this, there was like one bear that had all of these fish yeah. it could eat. And then this other one was like climbing up a mountain to like this world that was sort of mystical. And you're like, I think you're this bear who's like, <laughs> Oh yeah, there's fish down there, but I'm just gonna climb the mountain. Yeah, like, just in case. Because you chose acting doesn't work. I'll do art. What's next? Are you gonna be a musician? Yeah, <laughs> you didn't even know. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, it's it's so when when we you talk about risk and trust, mm -hmm. you you are the poster child for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so she know she speaks with authority in that. So that's fantastic. You got guts, you got courage. You just go where life opens. I don't know, I don't know any other way to do it. I know we've, we've talked about that. You, yeah. you do the same thing. Yeah, well for the first 14 years of my, I, I stepped out and started a design business when I was 21 mm -hmm. and it was the same thing. It was, it was complete trust and just go where the opportunity leads. <laughs> and, um, and I ran that business for 14 years, so. Yeah. Yeah, I completely. Oh, I got chills, I don't know, I just think when you when you take a step like that, there's just something inside of you that you kind of just have to. It's just sheer passion. Just like flow. <laughs> it's, like, it's like just I'm pure flow. Yeah. yeah. That decision. What's there's like a really beautiful quote, but like once you make a decision, all the helpful hands come. But you mm -hmm. have to make the decision. Yep. 100%. Yeah. Okay. So how do you make the decision? Because a lot of people, I think, maybe listening to this, mm -hmm. are at that crossroads, and in their heart, they want to pursue you know, their passion, and probably in this case, it's, it's art, and it's, mm -hmm. it's more, you know, probably fine art, and, and being an influencer, and, and selling their art as an influencer, and, and developing their art business. Mm -hmm. So how do you get to that place, would you say, where you make an actual decision? One of those decisions where it's like, you've gone through the event horizon, there's no going back. Like, yeah. you, you, you couldn't live with yourself again, you know, being a barista at Starbucks or whatever, you know? Right, yeah. I would say, no matter what, it, I, I kind of think if, if you're going to people for advice, you're already, you're already like not in a, a grounded state. So I would say no matter what, you kind of just need to get quiet and get back to the roots of who you are and what you really need to do. I like to take baths. 
love baths. <laughs> That's where I get all my good ideas. <laughs> um, so maybe you like baths too. Take like a really good bath and just get quiet. And I think that will help you know. Like, because once you know, you're right. There's no turning back. It's just you can't. Unknown. I think there's a lot of people that know because you, 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 as you said, you made the decision at three, right? Yes, and I couldn't. I and you kind of made the decision. Would you say at 21? Mm -hmm. Okay, so. There's a lot of people I think that know, mm. and they've known for a while, but they're they're sort of nervous, scared because they've heard their whole life, you know, go get an education, go get a good job, you know, get have insurance, uh, you know, make sure you have health care, uh, have a what do they call those retirement things? Four hundred one k. Four hundred one k. You know, have all these follow those rules, and their parents are like, art? Are you crazy? Like you can't make it in art. Um, so they're, they're nervous to make that courageous jump and leap into a decision. I think for a lot of people, COVID sort of opened a lot of people's eyes because they realized nothing is really certain. Yeah, and I agree. The only certainties in life are, I mean, you've been born and you die and change is constant. So I think if you, there's like, there's like a hospice worker who talked to all the people that were going to die and they all sort of, that's a lot of people's biggest regret, regret when you know, you know in your heart and your soul and you just like let it eat itself your whole life. And I, and I think about that. I like to look at myself and look at my death every day because it's important. It's important to look at what will happen. It's, it's going to happen and do I want to die that way knowing that I didn't listen I didn't go where it was open and I can't do that mm -hmm. personally and I know it, it can be really hard for people to not do the thing because our schools do train us from a really early age how to live in a linear pattern mm. from the public school system to college you do this to get here to do this to do this but anyone who's ever done anything great in their life had to look at that path and go ah I need to make it my own. This isn't mm -hmm. really me. This isn't who I am. And you can feel it. You can feel it when something is against yourself because that's what the world does for us. Everything that is against us, we know. You can feel it. Like when you don't like something, you go, oh, that's not me. And that's how like you can navigate the world. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's go to um, reimagining art education and taken into account like your various experiences you guys have had um, neither one of you went the route of traditional education mm -hmm. um, but you definitely learned from other people mm -hmm. who have walked the path that you wanted to walk um, mm -hmm. and you um, also probably were around others who did take that path of formal education so based on your experience what would you say let's start with like what is really like the deepest flaw, we know there's probably good things too, but what is the deepest flaw you see in traditional, let's say art education? Mm. Me first? Yeah, or either one. I would say that, especially with art, like it's such a, a broad and individual topic, like that you're sort of put in a box and told it has to be like this. Mm -hmm. where and you're not really free to um, express yourself within that mm -hmm. I mean to a degree but I think also having you know having people that are literally living that that life and doing it themselves like as opposed to being the teacher that's teaching you and not living it you know what I mean yeah. like having um, having people who are actually who actually walked that walk and are successful and mm -hmm. Yeah, because most, most art education, most art schools, um, the people who teach there, you know, maybe they show their work every once in a while, or maybe they're involved in like the school shows. I know when I learned, my professors, uh, teachers, you know, at, at school, art school, they, the only shows I saw them in were the school shows. Right. You know, the university would put on an art show mm -hmm. and they would be in it. And so most of the shows that they participated in were sort of academia um, type shows and not actual like retail gallery, they're going to sell their artwork shows. And they've built a career because they're, they've spent all their time teaching. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, there's that kind of like they're not teaching from true experience. They're just teaching from um, 
a skill set they've acquired through other academia. Yeah. 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 What about you? What are your thoughts on like a flaw to how school is done? Yeah, well, I think there's a benefit, at least for actors that go to school, that they get this community. I think that is a good benefit, and that you have this focused time. But I, I agree that by the end of that, you've learned all the rules, and you've put yourself in a box. And then in a lot of my acting classes I've been to with people that have done higher education for acting, you've learned the box. And then after all that four years of education and all that debt, <laughs> you then have to almost like rip the box off and yeah. then get back to the core of who you are as an artist and be able to re-find your core and your center. And that can be really hard once you've learned the technique and it, the technique can hide all of that. Mm -hmm. And that, that to me is the biggest thing, is that it can be really hard to get back to yourself. And it's scary, it is. Yeah, I mean, something that kind of occurs to me, I, I don't know, because I haven't really like studied education and the history, and I mean, I've seen a few documentaries and I know a little bit, but like I have this hunch that how um, Juilliards or, you know, formal art education or, you know, any, any sort of academia four year or more degree type, you have the certificate and so it universally means this thing to everyone. Um, that box that we're talking about, it was, it was sort of derived by committee over time. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't like um, a moment of inspiration or, or based on a person you know experience and what worked for them it was it's it's sort of a committee of thinkers sort of built out these curriculums and had this consensus that knowing this is important for whatever but it but it rarely goes along with you know a practical application in you life. know in life what's going to actually get you success model mm -hmm. and I was thinking back to when I um, I got the idea for the mastery program and I was sitting in my kitchen and I had used to um, teach his portfolio class and people would come we used to call it portfolio boot camp and they would come for eight weeks and it was just this crash course on how to get them to quickly find their voice and and then by the end of the portfolio boot camp, they were fully equipped to go and build out a portfolio. But the problem with it was, is it put, after eight weeks of sort of this boot camp, like intensity, and me, like I'm kind of intense, right? And I'm like, come on guys, you know, and they're doing four paintings a week and these Gosh. critiques and I know. And so then they leave and they're like, hey, I need a break. And yeah. then the break turned into a very long break and then they never did build out their portfolio, or very few did. So anyway, I was sitting in my kitchen and I had to order the paper for the portfolio class and I was thinking like there's got to be something more and my heart just wanted so badly to be able to share everything I knew and I was able to do in a career with other artists because constantly I would meet artists that didn't know how to actually make a living with what they were passionate about. So anyway, um, like literally as I was asking the question, like there's God, what else could be done? Like literally in that moment, like a download in a nanosecond, I saw the entire curriculum mm -hmm. of the mastery program in, in a, a flash. And so to me, it was supernatural. It was really outside of myself. It's not, I was definitely, I'm not smart enough to come up with that for sure. And so I, um, I just spent like two hours typing it out and I saw all three sections, I saw every single lesson, every single thing that we were doing. And what I realized when it was all written out, I literally looked at that one year of jam-packed lessons and I went, that is like my entire life as a professional artist, and I think it was about 15 years at that point, like literally made into a curriculum mm -hmm. on, on like how to go from zero to a professional of everything I've learned, all the mistakes I went through, all of the dumb things I'd done, you know, and how to like not do them. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, it was literally like a, a one year curriculum, like, you know, based on my experience. And that's what I'll say too about the mastery program that's so great is because we were talking about like you're inspired because you're you're walking the path of doing this with artists that are like definitely doing it, doing their own work. And then you get to the end and there's marketing. And in higher education, I think a lot of like the world is moving so fast, especially mm -hmm. with 
like you said, like when you were starting the internet and like mm -hmm. everything was just starting and now it's like whew, mm -hmm. and a lot of schools aren't capable of like keeping up with what that means for young people that are coming into the world as artists. They're teaching them skills but not how to market so they get out and they're kind of like oh like I have all these skills but I don't know what to do with them now mm -hmm. and the, in one year you learn all of that you just like yeah and another thing that just came to me when you were saying that that's really cool is um, just talking about reimagining education and art education I think that that mindset of elitism and the ones who know and the ones who don't know and and this sort of like you know kind of that hierarchy that's there is a huge flaw or mistake to it. Mm -hmm. And I think like sort of mentorship and um, apprenticeship and that type of thing and kind of learning on the job training type mentality is a way to really uh, move because what, what, like what we like to do or what our philosophy is, is Demetra and I are not the end all be all of, of art. Like we're not you know, we're just like everybody else, working our careers, mm -hmm. building our careers. I I have a lot of experience and I'm, I share openly all of it, so does Dimitra. Um, but people like you, people like you, they, they come in and they take our, our courses and then a lot of the graduates, you know, end up being coaches, end up being mentors, and they bring their expertise and what they know into it. And so it begins to be this sort of, I mean, it is around a foundation that's common, mm -hmm. but, there begins to be this like feeding and synergy of, of other people's experience, you know, and we learn things from students all the time. Somebody like you with this great design background where you've built like on teams, creative teams, software, and you understand user experience. I don't have that expertise. I can't like, you know, but I can show you my website and be like, all right, Atlanta, like <laughs> user experience, like? <laughs> like what is wrong here? Yeah. You know, cause I can't be an expert at all of it. Yeah. I just, and, and so I can glean, and being in this community of other people who are all doing it, right, is like a way to grow this, edu it's, it's to me social learning. Yeah, for yeah. sure, and I got to a point where like I was being kind of led more into UX design in a role that I had, and I was told, you know, go and do a course on it, go and do this, go and do that, and like the more I looked into it, the more I realized like I already had I had enough going that I could I could work it out, and so, you know, like it was, it was also about asking all the people around me who who had the experience, you know. Um, so I became fairly successful in that without going to that course or without doing that time getting a piece of paper that said you are now a UX designer, which you know? actually would hold you back because the world has yeah. meanwhile passed you by. That's right. Yeah. 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 And I think like like it's from my experience. Artists love helping other artists. Like they just, mm -hmm. everyone wants each other to grow because when you're in rooms with other artists, if someone is here, I'm just saying like here, you kind of have to like rise. So everyone wants to yeah. like help each other rise up. Yeah. And that's always really cool. Like it's from not like that in every creative. Every creative. Space. <laughs> okay, but well. That's what I find like with the Milan community though, like everybody is. is genuinely wants to help you move forward and take, help you get to that next level. Yeah, I think we're acting at least like in, when you're in rooms with someone who's just like on their game. You want to like, you want to play, you know, it's play. Like you want to play with that and it makes it easier when someone's really good because then you can sort of join them mm -hmm. in their, <laughs> in these moments of greatness. Well, it raises the sort of level of um, expectation or the level that you have for yourself and your yeah, own skills. what you think you're capable of. It raises of. the ceiling. Yeah, yeah. And that's really a really fun, cool room to be a part of. Okay, so now just like <laughs> throwing out any models we have in front of us, just yeah. like we're just reimagining art education. In a perfect world, like what would... Ooh, in a perfect world? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what would a... What would art education reimagined look like? Well, to me, I would love to get back to the natural world. Like, I think we're tribal. I think that we, we should be around lots of people because then, like you said, you can go to different people with, with different problems. Mm -hmm. And so I would love for there to be schools where there's lots of different teachers, lots of different artists, but artists are everything. They can be 
architects. They are they can be math. Like math is art in its own way. Mm -hmm. But I I would love for the world to have more education of how the earth works, how the world works. Like if. Like we're inspired by nature all the time, but what if we actually grew up learning about plants and how to actually navigate the stars and all these things that then you could embed into your art and move people with education of how the natural world works and also be able to be in this community with people that are doing their art forms in whatever way. Because I think every single person is an artist when they're uh, really pursuing what they love to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, um, like having seen education come home with my kids being home, you know, due to COVID and having virtual school and everything, um, like I just, I can just see like having that one teacher can completely like throw them off track mm -hmm. if they're not like supportive or whatever. And, you know, they have like 28 students or whatever. Um, in a in a standard classroom and I just for me like as a mom like I just want my kids to have all this amazing input from lots of adults not just like one teacher who can you know somehow influence them to think that they're not good enough or whatever mm. um, but like yeah like you were saying like community and yeah. I, I really think like it's so important to have lots of lots of people inputting into um, you know helping you learn and helping you grow instead of just having like the normal institute like you're going in like you have like a professor or whatever and you have this one person that's like feeding into you but um yeah that's cool mm. you know like that variety what you're yeah, saying I mm -hmm. think and that's what I think that you're doing like having so many mentors and coaches and everybody's able to you know express like their insight into something um it's yeah, even though we're all kind of on the same page, yeah. going through the same, you know, let's say curriculum or whatever. You've created a language that people can understand and to relate yeah. to, and then other people come in with their own Input life experiences, on yeah. but you've at least created a language that everyone can follow that uh, makes it cohesive, makes everyone understand what's, like you said, you said you, you said different words than language, but that's just how I interpreted yeah. it. Um, I've, I've had this like um, kind of wild idea about the ultimate art class, art education. Okay. Okay. Go for it. And uh, I'm going to do it one day. I am. And it's sort of a, I don't know how this would translate online. I can only think, I'm sure it can. I know that it can. Um, because I, I'm definitely a futurist and I feel like, I feel like the internet is, territory to conquer you know what I mean it's such a baby yeah, yeah. we don't even know what it's capable of. <laughs> exactly so um, I I know that this can translate but where I'm at right now I can only get there you know with an online with a on-site type of experience but I've had this thought okay so I've, I've studied a lot about um, like chaotic structure with businesses and how to get businesses to to have this like creative flow state, but then you you can't just have that like or you have Pixar. chaos. Like Pixar, I think, does that really well. Okay. And yeah, their goals, I think. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know a lot about it, but they, um, it's like you, you have to have sort of, it's like this flow that goes and then, you know, <laughs> like this mm -hmm. and so when when you're sort of open it's it's like brainstorming and any there's no dumb ideas and you're just like in this synergistic like creative flow where anything can happen anything is possible mm -hmm. but then you got to rein it in have some meetings i'm talking about in business right yes, yes. and and so it, chaotic is sort of a balance between chaos and order and when you are in this constant flow and that's kind of how we attempt to run our business is you know, these, all this brainstorming and anything is possible. And, well, let's do this and let's do that. And well, maybe we can, you know, harvest squirrels, right? Like, I mean. <laughs> and, Get them drunk. <laughs> and shape their tails. Now we got brushes. Oh okay. God. So, I mean, crazy ideas that obviously we don't do because then you have a meeting and you're like, that's not feasible, right? And, and so you have to do that. You have to rein it in yeah. and make plans and make some goals and get serious and be adults. 
But without the sort of openness, so you need that play, the kid yeah. play. Yeah, pull, and it's where the magic happens. The possible. marriage of both is is where they overlap like that. Is where the magic happens. That's what that's what I believe. So in an art school, I was thinking, like. I feel like we do that with the mastery program. There's this balance of sort of traditional skill and like, you know, here's here's actually how, what you're going to learn. You're going to learn how to draw. You're going to learn color theory. And it's all super important stuff. But then there's this sort of right brain, be free, just, you know, get in your flow state, just really express who you are. And, and we're constantly encouraging people to be free and loose and let it go, right? Mm -hmm. So I was thinking as an on-site experience, you, you still teach the, the actual academic stuff. So you have these times where you're learning and you're doing that. But then you have these designated times where you know it's all about, you know, it, it would be even spiritual. It would be, even, it would be an experience. And you would all come together and I just have this vision for it, like a bunch of artists painting, materials are everywhere, anything goes, do whatever you want. Of course you have this foundation and this base and everybody understands color theory and how to draw and whatever. And then you have all these materials and it's just a free for all. And you have spaces where you can make a mess and do whatever you want and you're all in this like energy together doing it, mm -hmm. okay? Meanwhile, you have musicians with like yes. flutes and drums and strings and all this stuff and they're improving. They're not they're not so playing cool. music, they're improving. They're catching that right brain frequency and they're just playing the music that comes to their heart in the moment and you're responding as artists to it. And then meanwhile, we have chefs yes that are there observing us Incredible. and they intuitively know what we all want to eat. Yeah. <laughs> and they create a feast for us. Right? I love it. <laughs> Intuitive feast of something. And so when you're done with your creative explosion, okay, because it's all right brain, you, you get to like, like gather and eat like together on this feast of amazing intuitively made food that just uh, sort of caps or, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's sort of... Um, brings home the whole experience yeah because and if all art is such a universal language but yeah. food is really a universal i know language. and it's primal yeah. it, what it does is it kind of connects your primal sort of subconscious zone into your more empathetic intuitive spiritual zone in one place and i don't know to me that would be like the ultimate if you had that balance of okay we're all serious we're adults we're learning color theory we got we're learning how to measure you know and then you have these moments, you know, where, and I think I could probably do that with like an event. You could, for yeah. sure. I should just have this like event that I want. To do that. To that do that. And then all cool. our students that have been learning, you know, online, that'd be a good place to start. So really, it'd be really, really cool. Yeah. So and like, then once you start, that. you can add to it and then people will be like, you know, it'd be cool for next time. Yeah. And then it'll grow. And I mean, that's how we do things. The thing that would be so cool is like, what could be birthed in those moments? Yeah. Like, well, when we could change the place. world. Yeah. Like, what would what would transpire? Yeah. Well, that what you said. That experience is like I didn't explain like reimagining schools, but it is that like I would love it. What if kids actually got to learn from those chefs in those moments, and also the musicians and the artists, and they got to have that experience. But they're also learning the things you need to learn. But you can learn it from the natural world. Mm -hmm. And imagine if you had to like had to, but have those play where you can actually learn. I think that'd be so cool. Super cool. Because <laughs> we haven't changed our education system in like 150 years. Yeah. We I was just watching a um I was just watching a documentary last night. It just happened to be on my whatever. I think it was on Telegram and um it was this like documentary about education. Mm -hmm. And it was basically invented in um, everybody just learned from, you know, each other, apprentices, at home, whatever, until 1850s. And then um, they said the guy's name, I can't remember, he invented um, this. He got it from Germany and uh, France and then and developed it here. And I think it was implemented first in Boston. And it was this, uh, um, you know, total, like, he, he basically believed in everybody learning the same thing. And, and then this, like, streamlined... And then he, he, it was an effort, the whole design of it, why they implement, and they were open about it. They wrote manifestos about it. The whole reason they created education 
the education system was to get everyone collectively doing the same things. Mm -hmm. And so they had bells. They, and it was to teach, um, you know, sort of discipline and to submit to authority mm -hmm. and to not think outside the box. They, they like coordinated a curriculum. Our curriculum in our schools, now I'm getting on a soapbox, but anyway, no. our curriculum <laughs> in our schools is designed specifically on purpose to keep people in a box. Yeah. How can you innovate? How can you invent? How can you, how can you express if, if you've been contained in a box and it's and it's a calculated move. They do it on purpose. And I know I and they're believe open that about we're it. all artists. Like we're all artists and we're all smart in different ways. And when we'd all learn differently, and I went to so many schools growing up. I went to ten different schools and I only did ten grades. Um, and I just observed from going to so many schools, people in these schools that were like, Oh, like I'm I'm stupid or I'm this and it's like no you're absolutely not it's just you're being taught in a way and that's you don't not fit into you. the cookie cutter yeah. system yeah you don't and we and we all are different we all should be learning from from artists from tr tribal people like uh, just so that you can actually get to the core of what you're good at because we all have something that we're passionate about that only we can do and provide to this world and I, I just feel so passionately about that because I just saw so many people that were down on themselves and it's like, no, you just, you just don't know what it is yet. And I hope that the world teaches you what it is because our school system doesn't. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when I sort of realized all of it, I, I kind of went through this stage in my life in um, like 2008 when I kind of, let's say, woke up to some things. I went through the stage where I got like deinstitutionalized and I the the institutional part and and there's so many of it it's in every facet of our of our life mm -hmm. um, that was kind of in me I, I was realizing is you know counterproductive to my destiny and I had to like step away from it and I went through this period of like deinstitutionalizing and all these boxes would break mm -hmm. and it would freak me out because I would just be talking to somebody I remember I pulled my kids out of school and I was like okay well, we're going to do online school which is basically still systematized institutional school it's just that you're doing it online mm -hmm. and so I kind of was starting there and then I would I was talking to somebody and they would say something and pff, this box would break mm -hmm. and I was like whoa okay, so now I don't have those borders like in that thought anymore. And so you have this like expanded freedom. Now you got, your box just got bigger, right? Yeah. And so you're like, Whoop. okay. You mean they could just learn by, you know, reading books and, and you, whoa, you know? I think what you've said is just exactly like hits the nail on the head of what we've been talking about with higher education. And at least I was saying it for acting, like when you do, you said it too, when you do learn um, an art form in school and you have to put yourself in the box, then you have to, you learn all the rules and you put yourself in the box and then at a certain point you have to be willing to remove the box and, and like you said, deinstitutionalize the thing that you just learned, the art form yeah. you just learned. And that can be hard because you feel like you did it for this purpose. And you made this investment. And yeah. You, yeah. So you made all this investment, but then you have to actually remove it and then see what happens. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah. And then you're open and you're like, ah, <laughs> I'm naked. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, when I've experienced it, it's been like terrifying and exhilarating and exciting and terrifying all at the same time. Yeah. And, but good things have always come of it. Good things always come of it. Yes. Okay. I've, lost track of time so oh. let's get let's get back to <laughs> what are we doing now we're we're going to critique yes okay so you guys ready to see some artwork to critique um is it up there can they see it all right so i gotta put my glasses on so i can see it how are those glasses doing for you uh, they're i mean they're cute they're cute compared to my other ones um all right Oh no. Okay, where'd it go? I saved them. Hold on. <laughs> Where's Jake when you need him? Okay. Oh, they're there. Okay, so here is um, the first one. So this is, is this the one you have? Okay. So, um, so this is, I, she's from um, Toronto, Surrey? 
I, I don't know, I'm not sure what the name is, but um, she did this lovely feminine figure with um, all these flowers and pink and um, I think you have very like nice expressive brush strokes and lines and it's a really like beautiful image that makes me think, it makes you feel um, kind of like what we were talking about. It makes you feel like all her boxes just broke and mm. she's embracing something new and it's like it feels like spring and you know and, and she feels exhilarated by it. So um, I would say to improve this painting, um, some things that I notice, and you guys can say things if you notice some things, is um, I think that some of the skin tones could be, it's almost like compared to the pink, the skin tones look a little green um, because of that contrast. So I would pink her up a little bit. She doesn't have to be as pink as the dress, but I would get some pink in the flesh tones and um, and and then like maybe highlights in the hair and vary the length of the hair. Maybe some of the hair can come over the dress like it does on the other side. Um, and then I feel like uh, the one flower in the back of her neck or, or head kind of makes it feel uh, kind of squished onto her. Like it would be good if maybe the hair went over that or that flower wasn't as noticeable. Um, what do you guys observe? Some things that could improve it. I love the sleeve. I think the sleeve is super cool. Yeah, it is. I think you said everything I was thinking. Just um, a little bit more pinks in the cheek, you know, would be nice. Because mm -hmm. it is so, it's romantic and very soft. And I do love all the brush strokes too. Um, maybe like, I would, I would love to see one larger brush stroke on the hair. Just like yeah. more big pinks. To vary it, yeah. Mm -hmm. The hair in the back on the on the right side um, looks further away, and it's different than the hair on the right side. But I think I mean on the left side. But I think some of the brush strokes get a little redundant on the left side, and there needs to be some bigger and some smaller. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with everything you said, and I think that the the palette is really pretty, and I love the the peachy pink and the blues. Um, but yeah, I would definitely work on adding some variation in the skin tones just so she feels a little more fleshy and, mm -hmm. um, and maybe some, just a couple of, um, highlights to kind of indicate more of the facial structure, and, but it's a really beautiful piece. And she also looks just like our social media manager, Bianca. <laughs> she does actually. <laughs> <laughs> so great portrait of Bianca. <laughs> Bianca's wearing pink, <laughs> her favorite color. Um, okay, so here we have an abstract, um, right? We got an abstract? Okay, um, so this is really, really nice. Um, what do you guys see? In case I take all your comments that you want. I love the balance of the color mm -hmm. and the scale. I think it's really cool. I love the, the pink with the red. Um, and the you know the teal the light green over the top. Um, the only the only thing that's a little jarring for me is the the shape with the crown like the that shape which has the crown on it. Um, I feel like it just needs to be a little more blended or there just needs to be some down here right yeah. at the bottom. I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or or just have another sort of texture over that to kind of soften the edge. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you just kind of like blur that it's almost like um running a glaze over it a blue glaze might work or something my eye just wants to go straight there i think because of the contrast yeah um, it's a sharp line yeah but it's a really cool piece i love it yeah i love it too yeah i love all the colors just i really like it a lot i love these like maybe they're they look like roses they look like bowing roses yeah and then this right here this like one little open mm. space which is like i think the focal point is it really i, I really like it like there's so much depth in it mm -hmm. and that's really hard to achieve in an abstract so yeah. i think it's really well done yeah and um he she i don't i don't it's probably a she i don't know she um uh, I love how it went, sh she took everything to the edge. Mm -hmm. um, so that works really well. Um, it feels expansive, it feels complete, it feels, you know, like a well done uh, composition. Oh, yeah. um, and um, I had something else I was going to say, and now I can't. 
Oh, I love, what I love about it is it feels really sophisticated, like a serious piece of art, but it also has this really like um, childlike, simple, you know, easy feel to it, you know, with the way the crown is done and the way the roses are done, like it's, it's almost has like a naive quality, but it still looks super sophisticated and like, like a real piece of fine art, you know? Yeah. So I think that's cool. Um, okay, so this is the last one. Um, so Tani, uh, and so, uh, I think that some the portraiture is done really well. Like he did a really good job with the proportions, and of both the faces, and um, and kind of like how they merge one into the other. That is done really really well. Um, and I think like the teeth are done well. Teeth are kind of hard, and they don't like come out at you, which sometimes people do that. Or so I think it's it's really well done. Like the way you did it. Um, I think compositionally, everything I want to look at is on the left side. Like there's this beautiful butterfly and then these two faces and all this color and this light and she has this pleasant look on her face. And so everything I want to look at is over there. And then on the right, there's kind of this like just dark, just like kind of vastness and then a shape that I want to figure out what it is, but I, but it, I don't know what it is and it feels like a like a drippy moon or something like that and and maybe if there was color in that moon and not just black and white mixed together and there was color in the black so it wasn't kind of this dead on arrival type black but it had like blue mixed into it or glazed over it um i think that would really help it a lot mm -hmm. and then i think of some of the lines in the in those cool shapes that kind of come and go in the moon. I'm calling it a moon, but it might not be a moon. It looks like a moon to me. Yeah, if, if some of them like pop forward and they were brighter and sharper, so it wasn't all on the same level, I think that would add another like depth and interest um, to it. So I would like to see more color in that moon shape and not just be kind of black and white mixed together. What do you guys think? I, I agree, like this, this, there's a nice resting space, but maybe since this other, the like, this hidden face on the on The green the right, face, yeah. Maybe there could be stars in those color palette, like in mm -hmm. the purple and the blue, like maybe you don't want stars, I don't know, but just to tie in those colors. Yeah, because it's like sun, moon, I mean, yeah. it feels kind of, yeah. But just to tie those colors in or do the opposite, do like the orange and the yellow to like bring it uh, with more of a, a balance. Mm. But I think, yeah, that's what I would say. I think glazing um, a blue into the black will help a lot, or mm -hmm. even a green, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? Yeah. It's just, it's just the lack of color um, and that sort of black and white mixed together on the whole right side is, is um, I don't think, quite working, quite tying the whole thing together. And it's an easy fix, mm -hmm. super easy fix. Yeah, I think the rendering's really cool, like mm -hmm. super detailed. Um, but I agree that the darker space feels like it's a little heavy compared to the rest and it needs a little something else there. It just feels a bit empty and that's kind of, the dark space kind of draws you in there. Um, but like Ali said, you want to look at all the colourful, beautiful um, imagery that's there as well. So I, yeah, I think it's a really cool piece. You just maybe a little more detail in the, the black area and some colour. Yeah. Okay. Well, so um, uh, we, every week that we do this, we want to critique um, your artwork. And so we'll choose a few pieces each week to critique. So make sure if you want to um, uh, have a possibility of being critiqued that you use that hashtag um, artbreakthrough2021. And, uh, and then that way we can find your art and, um, and so we can, we can critique it. Um, so now, um, if there's any questions um, from anybody watching, we would love to hear your questions. Hopefully you've written down some questions or I kind of, I'm supposed to say that earlier. I'm supposed to tell people <laughs> earlier, like before we critique, if you have questions, so they can be writing their questions. Next time. <laughs> I know. So if there aren't any questions, it's my fault because I forgot to like, you know. Are there any questions? There is one question from Julie Briggs. Okay. How long after you finish a painting should you wait to varnish it? 
Okay. Yeah. Well, that is very easy. If you read the no. can, um, <laughs> it will say, I think, six months on it. But I think what the manufacturers are doing is they don't want to like get sued by somebody who puts it on a wet painting and then it cracks. And so they kind of make those warning labels, kind of like the back of me medicine. You know, it's like mm. kind of for the lowest common denominator possible, possible situation. So you can ignore the six months basically when it's bone dry. So if you've used mediums or a fast drying white um, and you kind of rub it with your hand and you look at your hand, there's nothing sticky or tacky and there's no paint on your hand, it's bone dry, then you can, you can varnish it. So that can be anywhere from a week to two weeks to uh, a month. If you put it really heavy and no mediums, maybe it would be three months, six months. Mm -hmm. So whenever your painting is bone dry. Okay. That is the one question that we have. That is our only question? Wow. I blew it, guys. <laughs> <laughs> we, didn't give, we didn't give him any, uh, any, time. any time to, like, <laughs> you know, write down questions. Well, you know, let's face it. Jake's really good at this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. You have, you have to fail to succeed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, usually I'm on the other side of things, like where you guys are, and I don't have to think at all. I just kind of sit here and talk, you know, and he pulls things out of me. It's, like, really easy. And he's the one that's got to, like, look at the clock. And I'm so obvious when I look at the clock. I'm like... <laughs> Oh, it's 12.56. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a behind-the-scenes podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where you can kind of see, you know. What we're doing. <laughs> what not to do or what to do. Or, but that's okay. Um, okay, well, <clears throat> just. Okay, oh, a question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's probably quite an open-ended answer as well. But um, how to decide price for a painting? <laughs> Yeah, we that a is lot a lot of people ask us that question and there isn't a one size fits all answer. And the great thing about the day that we live in now is it used to be a, a really kind of cookie cutter answer for that. And you just kind of price things per square inch. You come up with your formula. Um, I used to tell people um, like a good, a good starting amount, you know, for if you're going to resell it in a gallery or in the art market, is about you know like two dollars a square inch up to like three dollars a square inch mm -hmm. is a good range for a starting out art artist if you're selling it in a gallery and there's somebody else making money from from the painting like a middleman of some sort um, and that's still a good rule of thumb um, if you sell your work for too much less than two dollars a square inch in a gallery they're not going to want it because they need to make money um, and and then once you kind of start selling your work and there's a draw and there's a pull on it, you can begin raising your prices. But if you're just selling your work yourself, um, really it's kind of up to you. I've seen so many different models of this where, and you know, when you think about reimagining art education, I also spend a lot of time reimagining art patronage. Mm -hmm. I probably spend more time on that than I do art education, thinking about it. And that is really what we're doing right now is reimagining art patronage because there has been this sort of box or this cookie cutter system um, based on elitism for the most part um, behind art patronage that has sort of dictated the philosophies around how do you price artwork mm. and right now we're in the process of really challenging a lot of those thoughts and so many people it. are owning art now which yeah. 100 years ago was not the case that was not the case and I kind of believe that our days of aspiring to have artwork that's worth like a million dollars um, and you know auctioning off in Sotheby's is, is coming to a close and artists should be more uh, thinking more in terms of you know prints and multiples and products that they can put their artwork on and have like um, you know their originals I mean it can be an investment it can go up in value but does it really have to be so rare and scarce that it goes up that much? And so, and you'd have to be quite famous and well known for that to happen. And like you said, more people are buying art. And I think a really good range for art to sell, for original art to sell, and this is gonna sound crazy because it's a huge range, is from 200 bucks to 5,000. That's a really good range right there, mm -hmm. you know? Or, or even 200 bucks to 10,000, depending on how established you are. And that is such a huge range. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do is ask yourself, if you're really prolific and you're painting a lot and you're sort of getting started, 
I would price it lower and paint a lot. I mean, a lot, a lot. Like try to try to paint at least two per week. Mm -hmm. Four per week would be even better. And just really, and if you're if your painting's on canvas and it's large and it's oil, and um, and it took you, you know, 50 hours to produce it, well, then you can't sell it for $200, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You kind of have to think about, you know, what what would you want for it? Maybe maybe 1,200 on a low end is good for that, and you know, 2,500 on a mid end is is a good price for that. So really, pricing your work is super personal. It's based on um, uh, what I recommend is that all artists should be, especially in the beginning selling their work, super duper prolific. Make a ton of artwork and, um, and sell it for as, as low as you can without devaluing it. And I think the person buying it should feel it. It should, it should hurt a little bit so they appreciate it, but, but not so much that it's not possible or they feel irresponsible or like they've, they've they can't eat and feed their children for two months and you know what I mean like mm -hmm. it has to be it has to make sense yeah there's a sweet spot of when something you you were like I put I invested in this so it like means a lot to me mm -hmm. yeah which is good and what I tell artists all the time is if you want to sell your work the first thing you should do is go buy a piece of artwork mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because then you know really what it feels like mm -hmm. you know what is that hurt point you know, mm -hmm. for you and where you're at, because you are your own demographic in a lot of a lot of times, and um, and so uh, because your taste level is what is going to dictate who buys your artwork, and usually our demographic, although we don't want to hear that, but usually our demographic is what dictates our taste level, mm -hmm. and so um, so if you if if you would spend eight hundred dollars for a piece of artwork that you fell in love with and you just you're so happy well you just bought a piece of artwork mm -hmm. yeah and it just was your first my piece. first original yeah right. and do you feel like buying that piece of art and going through that experience helps you understand the people buying your artwork yeah i was just thinking about what you were saying and i was like i think that's really really helpful and i think that that is valuable like if you're going to be selling your art start buying art so that you know what it feels like, what other people, what experience you want to be giving your, mm -hmm. your patrons, whoever's supporting you. Um, I think it's important to put out there, like put your money out there for what you want to receive. Totally. Yeah. It's, it's almost a principle, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. You have anything to add to it? I was just going to say, we have a bunch of questions. No. Oh, see, that's why I should have said it earlier. Bunch of questions yeah. in no time. <laughs> oh. Oh. It's okay. Jake goes over time all the time. Mm. I think he went over like 10 minutes last week. Ew. A good one um, for you then. The deadline to sign up for the conference. So the in-person one is closed, correct? Yeah, the in-person is, is sold out, but um, for the online conference, I, I, I don't know that there's a deadline. I think the deadline is like... Yeah open until just before. Um, but the cool thing about signing up now is, um, or as soon as you can, is right when you sign up, you get the journal um, digitally. And that will kind of get you in the mindset and prepared and it, it'll get you, you know, thinking about it. And, and really, I also want to say, that since I brought up the journal, I'm going to ask my own question now. Um, what is the journal for? Okay, here's the answer. Uh, <laughs> so there's some people out there that like have the journal or they went online and they bought the journal and they're waiting for us to send to it, to them and they're worried about getting it in time. And um, why we created the journal, first of all, the journal is gonna work for anybody. They don't even have to go to this conference. It's, it's, it's a perfect tool to get unstuck and to, because artists get stuck all the time. I get stuck, you guys get stuck, we get stuck, right? And this journal pr gives you prompts and inspiration and motivation and really cool exercises to get you unstuck and to really, it's, it's just a super fantastic journal. I think all artists will want this. Um, but we designed it so that after the conference, after you've gone through the experience of the conference and, and you've, you've had your breakthrough and you've experienced breakthrough and you've, you've like been in this collective breakthrough, Right? Which, is, which is what we're believing for, um, then this journal is there to facilitate sort of the aftermath of that. Mm. And it's something you'll be able to use ongoing. So it's not like so, so important that you have it like 
it's not like a workbook we're going to follow through during the conference. It's, it's, and I'll be referring to it during the conference, but the digital copy that you have for the conference will be perfect. And then when you get the physical afterwards, it'll, you'll have it there to like work through. So well, anyway. I personally think like, I'm probably going to want more than one because I'm going to work through it a couple times, you know, more than one. We always need breakthroughs. Yeah. Yes. And you, you've <laughs> helped us work on that journal with all your amazing design experience and, um, and you, like, so you know it's good because you've, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Cause you've like you intimately been, yeah. <laughs> you're like, I want <laughs> two or three. <laughs> I know, I'm so excited. They, they get here really soon, like yeah. any, any moment now. Any so now. I know, I'm going to be watching for those trucks. <laughs> So anyway, there, the, I think for online, there is no deadline. And um, uh, so I would sign up as, as soon as you can. Yeah, for sure. And <clears throat> just another question that's like relatable to what's happening right now is the in-person graduations. Mm. And how many times are you going to do that? OK, we're going to do the graduations once a year. And it will always be around this time, end of August. Um, so this year, if you have completed the online program and you, um, you have your, either you've already received your certificate or you've been approved to receive one, um, then you are eligible to graduate. And so um, that means, to, so what, how do you get el eligible? You um, have completed the program, meaning you've watched all the videos and you've done all the exercises, you've built out your portfolio, and how we know that you, um, utilize the marketing is through your website. So you have to build that website and put your portfolio on the website. Your portfolio has to be 25 pieces at least. So we believe you've completed the program when you have 25 portfolio pieces and a built out website. And, um, and so that's the requirement and that's how you graduate. And, um, and then we, we're having this beautiful event um, at a, an event center, and it, uh, it's not an event center, it's like a, anyway, it's like a, it's a space that's, that's really beautiful. And so the people that come in person to graduate, we're going to put their artwork up and we're going to celebrate, but we're going to live stream the whole thing and then show the online graduates and their artwork and feature them and show people how they can find them and their websites. And, and anyone can come watch and live? Anyone can come. Anyone oh, cool. can come and watch live. Um, and you don't even have to be an artist. You could just be somebody who stumbled on this YouTube channel and you're like, wow, this is cool. I don't know. Look like, at all this art. Like, come yeah. do an online graduation. You're yeah. invited. <laughs> um, so yeah, anybody's invited to, the, to, to watch, observe, be a part, celebrate with us, um, these graduates. And, uh, and then, but this is our first one. And so we're, we're like, and we were a little bit, um, uh, I don't know. It took us a while to get all our pieces together, so it's a, it's a little bit of late notice. But um, there's going to be another one next year. So if you miss this one, then you can be a part of the one next year. And we're hoping um, that people. We know we've gotten a lot of people that have submitted their their artwork and everything for the online. And um, and there's a few people that will be physically here. So yeah. So cool. you can come um, physically and and just enjoy with us and celebrate with us, even if you're not graduating. Um, if you live near um, Athens, Georgia, and otherwise you can watch online. Cool. Yeah, so I'm excited for it. It's going to be a lot of fun. And it's right during the conference, so all the people that are coming to the conference mm -hmm. will, be there. Will, will be there, yeah. So cool. Yeah. Okay, well, this was a lot of fun. Thanks, you guys, for watching um, this episode of Light Movement Podcast. And... Um, Thanks, you guys, for all your valuable insight and, you know, <laughs> great insights. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks for having us. <laughs> okay, so we'll see you next time. Thank you.